you break it. Because it no longer works for you. See, brother. I said we have to introduce our people to reality. Go ahead. The oppression <laughs> has yes, us to live in a world of sick political fantasy. Yeah. We, are, we have to come out of it and face yeah. reality. That's this right. is an essence of what I was trying to get out of it. I just want to say before you begin that since this is my family meeting, and I know you come up from the church tradition, but I know it's all in love. Uh -huh. All right? No, I'm serious. I mean, because you may not, you may have misinterpreted it earlier. Yeah, no, no, no. This is a love thing. I, I see the love, but I'm serious. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's true. Let me first say that uh, I would just like to thank those who had the vision and determination to bring all of us together because it is an honor to be in the presence of Professor John Henry Clark. I would not be sitting here That's right. if it was not for John Henry Clark. Yeah. He all this in the He has a fundamental commitment to the life of the mind and fuses it to the struggle for freedom of African people. Right. I've been reading John Henry Clark in Freedom Ways in the 1940s, and his book on Malcolm X, and the text on Marcus Garvey. I still read him in the City Sun, which is a black newspaper in Brooklyn on Africa and the New World Order. And of course, he recalls the wonderful time we had in Columbia when we sat at his feet. We had a citywide seminar. You might remember that, Professor Clark? Yeah. I was then an assistant professor, 23 years old, sitting at the feet of Professor John Henry Clark at Columbia University. He would come cross town to teach at night at Columbia. And the dialogue that we had, the engagement that we had was very, very real. So I just want to say that it's a blessing to be in his presence and to know, in fact, that we have such firm shoulders upon which to stand as he indeed slowly passes the baton, not to one person, but to each and every one of indeed, us indeed. to empower ourselves intellectually, spiritually, politically, and so forth. Like each and every one of you, I could sit here and listen to him all day and all night. His encyclopedic mind is one that is able to not just put forward facts, but most importantly, to put forward a global framework, that sense of history that I was suggesting briefly this afternoon. It's true, most of my own work has tended to focus on a particular slice of the human history. Professor Clark talks about the grand scope of human history going back to the beginning of the human adventure in the Nile Valley. That takes tremendous interdisciplinary work and discipline. I tend to be much more limited. I talk primarily about the modern period. That is to say, the period in which black folk began to get caught up within the whirlwind of white supremacy. And I talked this afternoon about white supremacy itself being a construct put forward within the age of Europe and the degree to which the Atlantic slave trade sits at the very center of that age, 1492 to 1945. The attempt of those nations between the Euro Mountains and the Atlantic Ocean to shape the world in their own image. The attempt to Europeanize the whole globe, not just Africa, but Asia as well. Indian brothers and sisters, Indochina, Latin America as well. The breakthroughs in military technology and oceanic transportation and nation-state consolidation, all as a part of ensuring a particular part of the world as the imperial center, the metropole, as it were, and hence imperialism and colonialism linked to white supremacy and the subjugation of peoples of, of color being so fundamental for this period. So that I, my, my, my scope is much, much more limited than that of Professor Clark's. Uh, secondly, I tend to highlight the decolonization process so that, for example, Professor Clark can talk about the various rises of Europe and the various rises of Africa, going back to the great ancient African civilizations and then the decolonization process in the form of the resistance for independence from European colonialism, especially uh, culminating in the 1950s 
and 60s. But again, I would want to argue we must think globally. That is to say, when we talk about decolonization, we're not just talking about Africa. We're talking about India, 1947, and China, 1949, and a whole host of other efforts of other brothers and sisters around the world responding to Europeanization of the world. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, most of my work has been on the third, not just the age of Europe, ending in 45 with the mushroom cloud over Nagasaki and Hiroshima on the concentration camps in Europe itself. Europe, a devastated and divided continent, now dependent on the United States and the Soviet Union. And not only the decolonization process that Professor Park alluded to earlier, the Chilamumbas and and Krumahs and Tourays and others, but the degree to which the USA moves to the center of the historical stage after 1945. And like Europe, attempts to engage in the Americanization of the world. The age of globalization with transnational corporations, IMF, World Bank, creating a global workplace and a global financial network and a global cultural bazaar centered in that entertainment information supergiant called the USA, but connected to other powers, Japan, Britain, Germany, and so on. And the question then becomes, well, what in fact do African peoples in different places, Brazil, Jamaica, Ethiopia, Harlem, South Side of Chicago, do in light of this context? Uh, and that, of course, is the fundamental challenge for me. And uh, I think what's probably most controversial, I just love to probably introducing this, uh, uh, the issue is that for me, you see, I, uh, I'm one who tries to take seriously the prophetic elements within the African uh, Christian tradition, because it was in fact the black church that served as a major institutional response to the absurd that African people had to come to terms with. And it was an Africanization of that Christianity, no doubt. But it had elements that warrant serious criticism, but it also had ways of preserving black humanity. I talked this afternoon a bit about those guttural cries and wrenching moans and visceral groans that are still at work within black music today. So it's very difficult to, over, to overlook the degree to which the black religious tradition and all of its complexity was a crucible by which, by which black folk could preserve sanity. And I still build in part upon that tradition, especially with the, uh, the, the musical uh, uh, component of that tradition. And at the same time, I talk seriously about uh, radical democracy. I think it's probably here where I have my fascinating exchanges with my cultural nationalist brothers and sisters and black nationalist brothers and sisters because uh, there, there, there's a sense in which for me coming out of the black Christian tradition that tries to keep hold of the humanity of other folks that I want to ensure that we do not in any way mirror the kind of hatred and bigotry that has been directed at us even as we attempt to come up with effective strategies for struggle. I agree with Professor Clark when he says that we can't engage in milquetoast alliances with other folk without coming together and having strength when one goes into an alliance. That's one of the reasons why the summit was so very important and you all know the crucial role that Professor Henry Clark plays in Chicago in the summit that Ben Chavis and uh, Ben Louis Farrakhan and a host of others who are a part of a right. to ensure that there's a black strength so that we can treat each other with respect and take each other seriously even as we disagree because we're trying to keep the focus on the suffering of people of African descent. It's just for me, my radical democratic project is one that argues that in the age of globalization, we are ultimately going to have to coalesce with other folk who don't look like us if we deal with, if we're going to alleviate that deep suffering. But that's under a certain set of conditions, not to be manipulated or played on, but to feel as if the powers at the present time, corporate elites, bank elites with their political elites, cannot be broke. 